Heading straight first to the United Nations General Assembly, which is holding an emergency session to vote on a resolution opposing the U.S. government's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The UNGA meet has been called by Arab and Muslim states days after the U.S. vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution against Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. But call it bullying and blackmail, threats and blatant intimidation, it, it appears to go with the persona of Donald Trump. Ahead of the vote, the mercurial U.S. president threatened that he could withhold aid to those countries that vote against America in the United Nations. For all of these nations that take our money and then they vote against us at the Security Council, or they vote against us potentially at the assembly. They take hundreds of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars, and then they vote against us. Well, we're watching those votes. Let them vote against us. We'll save a lot. We don't care. If that isn't a threat, wonder what is. Amid speculation in New Delhi as to how India could vote, the MEA spokesman in his uh, weekly briefing was carefully neutral. On the voting itself, I think we should just wait for the voting to happen. You will get to know in which direction we are going to vote. Speculation in India uh, is that, uh, that New Delhi might decide to abstain to avoid spoiling relations with the U.S. and Israel while also reassuring the Palestinians. Also important to note that India receives very little American financial aid, so that is not going to be one of the considerations, only about $100 million. What India wants from Trump instead is something else. It has been carefully cultivating the Trump administration, looking for diplomatic and political support, seeking access to the U.S. market and high tech, uh, and uh, of course, wanting sophisticated U.S. military hardware, cultivating Trump may not be the mood in the General Assembly where reports say as many as 150 of the 193 countries could vote against the U.S. In fact, the United Nations draft resolution is heavily weighed against the recent American decision on the Holy City. This is what the resolution says. It reaffirms 10 previous UN Security Council resolutions on Jerusalem, some date back to 1967. It says direct Israel-Palestinian talks must decide Jerusalem status. All United Nations members must comply with the resolution. Actions contrary to these resolutions are not acceptable. The U.S. had earlier vetoed a resolution in the Security Council calling on Trump to rescind his decision. The first veto in six years. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley did not hold back her anger over this vote. What we witnessed here today in the Security Council is an insult. It won't be forgotten. It's one more example of the United Nations doing more harm than good in addressing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Today, for the simple act of deciding where to put our embassy, the United States was forced to defend its sovereignty. The record will reflect that we did so proudly. Thank you, President Trump and Ambassador Haley, for standing up for Israel and for standing up for the truth. Ultimately, the truth will prevail. For Trump, it was another opportunity to paint uh, superpower America as a victim. The United States, the people that live here are great citizens that love this country. They're tired of this country being taken advantage of, and we're not going to be taken advantage of any longer. Many remain skeptical that Donald Trump will carry through on his threat to withhold aid because key U.S. allies are backing the resolution. Jordan and Egypt each receive $1 billion in assistance every year. Saudi Arabia, which is backing the resolution, is another close ally of the U.S. It will be interesting to see how these equations will play out. Pakistan firmly believes that the establishment of a viable, independent and contiguous state of Palestine on the basis of internationally agreed parameters, the pre-1967 borders and with Al-Quds al-Sharif as its capital is the only lasting solution of the Middle East crisis. In this regard, Pakistan fully endorses the OIC position reflected in the final communique of Extraordinary Islamic Summit held in Istanbul on 13th December 2017. Joining us this evening, Pinak Ranjan Chakrabarti, former Deputy Ambassador to the U.S., a distinguished fellow at the ORF uh, and former Secretary at the MEA, joining us from New Delhi. Nicholas Grossman, International Relations Professor at the University of Illinois in the U.S. And we will be joined by Lior Weintraub, former diplomat and political strategist from Jerusalem in just a bit. Good evening to uh, all of you here. 
Ambassador Chakravarti, let's begin with you. How do you think India is going to vote? Well, that's a, that's a leading question. I think uh, given the fact that uh, we have done a, um, a navigated a fine balancing act between, uh, between uh, Israel and Palestine and our other Arab uh, friends, I would put my shirt on an absten abstention, I think, considering also the fact that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is to visit India, uh, I think, early next year. Uh, it would uh, seem to me that uh, the weight of uh, weight of opinion would uh, mm, would probably take us uh, towards the uh, abstention vote. Would you say India's response to this entire episode has been a bit pusillanimous after the government came out and said we are going to dehyphenate Israel and Palestine and we are going to be guided by our own interests. Uh, the statement that came out of the MEA on the 6th of December after Donald Trump's uh, decision to move the embassy and, and the abstention if it happens tonight is once again going to put India in that bracket of countries that do not stand up. Uh, I don't agree with you in, uh, at all. I think uh, India India has, uh, has uh, developed relationships with Arab countries and Iran and Israel uh, to the best of our interest. I think you ignore the fact that there are developments in the Arab world itself. And if you, if you were to read what's happening uh, in the Arab world, how Saudi Arabia is behaving, the kind of pressures it is putting on Jordan and Lebanon, and I think uh, they are also collaborating with Israel to, uh, to a large extent. So I think there is, a, there is a change of mood in the Arab world. Although I dare say that, uh, that uh, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which, uh, which has effectively functioned as the capital, I remember sitting in Tel Aviv in our embassy, mm. and for every everything we used to go to Jerusalem to meet uh, the Foreign Affairs Ministry, the Prime Minister, all our delegations had to go there. Of course, that was West Jerusalem and not East Jerusalem. So I don't think this is a this this is this is a fact that has been there for a very long time, and I think uh, ever since India established diplomatic relations with Israel in 1991. Uh, we have uh, we have been visiting Israel. I remember the ambassadors used to go to uh, Jerusalem to present credentials. So really, that is one aspect of it. But then, if you go back to UN resolutions, the UN partition uh, plan of 1948, there is of course, which of course uh, states very clearly that there has to be two independent states, Israel and Palestine. So I think that, of course, has not happened in the sense that the Palestinians want it or even I would say even how India wanted it. Right. The fact is that we, we remain uh, commit, committed to that position of having an uh, independent Palestine state. Sure. Uh, Nicholas, uh, it's going to be a difficult decision. Uh not just for India, where we're saying abstention is equal to real politic, but also the likes of Saudi Arabia, even Pakistan, because Donald Trump has made it very clear, aid is linked to how you behave at the United Nations. He said that, but my guess is most countries interpret that as a bluff, especially the countries that receive the most military aid and foreign aid from the United States. So the biggest recipients are Afghanistan, Israel, Iraq, and Egypt. And those four, the United States is providing the aid to advance American interests, to help them maintain security, to cooperate on terrorism, to gain access military to military contacts, intelligence to intelligence, to gain influence. And that's the largest portion of the foreign aid budget by far. So the United States is most likely not going to cut them off, which means that they should feel free to vote. And that's even more the case because the UN General Assembly does not make binding resolutions. It's a statement, it expresses their opinion, but it has no effect on international law on the United States or any other country.
Lior Weintraub, uh, also joining us, a former diplomat and political strategist from Jerusalem. Good evening, Lior. Uh, as many as 150 countries are expected to vote against the United Nations' decision to declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel and to move their embassy there. Uh, how does Israel see this also? Uh, is, it, is it reflective of the fact that the U.S. may be losing its stature as a global power, which is why the president has had to resort to an open threat? No, I think this is another indication that the UN is not a fair stage for Israel. And I think this is the second, this is the first time where the United States encountered this fact by trying to obey its own law, by legislating, by obeying a law that was legislated 22 years ago. And all they, they claim that they recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, they recognize reality. And we in Israel believe that recognizing reality is the first step in order to achieve viable peace. And I think they also now uh, uh, encounter the fact that whenever Israel is on the table, you'll have an automatic majority and you'll have uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, just, uh, just uh, uh, willing to go all out against Israel when the world is facing tremendous danger and atrocities are happening all over the world. So now the Trump administration really understands what Israel has been facing in the last 70 years. Ambassador Chakravarti, Pakistan is among the co-sponsors of this resolution and that's interesting uh, given uh, the amount of money that Pakistan receives from the U.S. Do you see China's work at play? Well, it will be very interesting to see whether the Trump administration puts his uh, money where its mouth is. I mean, if, if Trump is uh, making those threats, let him make it good in the case of Pakistan. I mean, that India would be very interested in knowing how, how the Trump administration, because I don't see Pakistan walking away from what they see as a great Islamic cause. And uh, they will certainly vote for the, in fact, they are the co-sponsor. So I don't think, and if Pakistan thinks that, uh, that all the aid that they get from the U.S. for coalition support funds and all kinds of things, uh, 33 billion or 34 billion in the last uh, couple of decades, then let's uh, let China step in and provide that kind of money. Let let uh, Trump uh, let the Trump administration take that call, and uh, let it be true to what it is saying. Uh, but I doubt if that is going to happen because I think uh, uh, it's a bit of a bluff. I think and. Uh, it's a bit of a, you know, uh, sort of shaking the stick uh, at some, 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 of the, uh, some of the more uh, vulnerable uh, aid recipients. Uh, so I think, it, I don't think it will have too much of an effect. I do, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, people will vote uh, um, upwards of 150, I think, for the resolution. And I don't think the U.S. can, can do much about that. Although, of course, the votes, uh, the U UN General Assembly vo uh, resolutions are non-binding and has no effect, really, in terms of uh, uh, any, any changing any reality on the ground. Nicholas, do you believe the U.S. will walk the talk? I think so, uh, but only in a very small case. So it's possible with a few countries, perhaps recipients of aid in Africa, other countries that... Trump would like to eliminate the foreign aid for anyway. He might use this as an excuse. But the biggest reason for the threat is for domestic audience consumption, that Trump shows that he looks tough, that he won't uh, back down. There's a group of his supporters that like to see him threatening other countries like this. It's drawing on his background as a reality television star. And what it also does is it gives a lot of other countries an opportunity to stand up to Trump. It personalizes it. As opposed to just voting to express their national policy on Jerusalem, they're also voting to say that they won't be pushed around by the United States, by U.S. threats. And so it'll mostly end up being a bluff, but the people that are paying attention to it like seeing the reality show threat and won't be paying as much attention to whether the U.S. really follows through on it in the end. Right, and we'll try to uh, bring our viewers live pictures and developments. Uh, uh, remember, 14 Security Council members voted in favor of the Egyptian drafted resolution earlier, which did not specifically mention the U.S. Uh, or Donald Trump.
but expressed, quote-unquote, deep regret at recent decisions concerning the status of Jerusalem. Uh, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, in a letter to dozens of uh, United Nations states uh, on Tuesday had warned that Washington would remember those who voted Do for I the resolution the criticizing the American decision. As this capital of the state of Palestine, state Mr. Of President, Palestine. Excellencies, friends, Al-Quds Jerusalem is a holy city for all three monotheistic religions. It is the responsibility of entire humanity to preserve its historic status. Unilateral decisions on its status threaten the multi-ethnic and multicultural fabric of the city. Such steps undermine prospects for a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. They hinder the vision for a two-state solution. Regrettably, the Security Council failed to deliver on its responsibilities once again through the use of veto power. Now, the duty falls upon the UN General Assembly to bring justice. Excellencies, dear friends, before this meeting, a UN member state threatened all the other members. We were all asked to vote no or face the consequences. Some are even threatened with the development aid cut. Such an attitude is unacceptable. This is bullying and this chamber will not bow to do that. It is unethical to think that the votes and dignity of member states are for sale. Let me put it in this way. We will not be intimidated. You can be strong, but it, this doesn't make you right. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, this is a critical moment in history. The Palestinian people today will place us on the right side of the history. We it is indeed a critical moment in history if 150 countries of 193 at the UN vote against the United States, despite Donald Trump and Nikki Haley's warnings. I'm going to thank Pinak Ranjit Chakravarti and Nicholas Grossman. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, uh, Palestinian anger is evident on the streets with riots in Gaza, the West Bank and Jerusalem, but there could be a silver lining. Simmering anger in the Palestinian territories over Donald Trump's move on Jerusalem blew up into confrontations with Israeli police in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip and, of course, the Holy City. Palestinian mobs threw homemade Molotov cocktails and rocks as Israeli police retaliated with tear gas. The Palestinian Red Crescent reported more than 80 injured when Israeli police fired rubber bullets. Three others sustained more serious injuries when hit by live bullets. The riots have led to four Palestinian deaths so far. Nearly 500 people, including women and minors, have been arrested by Israeli police. The violence is expected to escalate on Friday, the traditional day of prayer for Muslims. We call on our Arabic and Muslim nations to surround the Israeli and American embassies in Arab countries and drive the American and Israeli ambassadors out. We will use every kind of resistance to break this decision. Israel has reported at least two dozen rocket attacks from Gaza on its southern settlements. Clearly, the Palestinian-Israeli peace process is dead, but the Israelis believe it is dead only for now. They say Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has no alternative to the U.S. It explains his continued tough stance on Hamas and refusal to abandon diplomacy with Israel. Bureau report, Vion. And the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley is addressing the assembly. Let's listen in. Standing here today, being forced to defend sovereignty and the integrity of my country, the United States of America, many of the same thoughts have come to mind. The United States is by far the single largest contributor to the United Nations and its agencies. We do this in part in order to advance our values and our interests. When that happens, our participation in the UN produces great good for the world. Together we feed, clothe, and educate desperate people. We nurture and sustain fragile peace in conflict areas throughout the world and we hold outlaw regimes accountable. 
We do this because it represents who we are. It is our American way. But we'll be honest with you. When we make generous contributions to the UN, we also have a legitimate expectation that our goodwill is recognized and respected. When a nation is singled out for attack in this organization, that nation is disrespected. What's more, that nation is asked to pay for the privilege of being disrespected. In the case of the United States, we are asked to pay more than anyone else for that dubious privilege. Unlike in some UN member countries, the United States government is answerable to its people. As such, we have an obligation to acknowledge when our political and financial capital is being poorly spent. We have an obligation to demand more for our investment. And if our investment fails, we have an obligation to spend our resources in more productive ways. Those are the thoughts that come to mind when we consider the resolution before us today. The arguments about the President's decision to move the American Embassy to Jerusalem have already been made. They are by now well known. The decision was in accordance to U.S. law dating back to 1995, and its position has been repeatedly endorsed by the American people ever since. The decision does not prejudge any final status issues, including Jerusalem's boundaries. The decision does not preclude a two-state solution if the parties agree to that. Now let's talk about uh, what is called the biggest corruption scandal in independent India. Court has acquitted former telecom minister A. Raja of involvement in a multi-billion dollar corruption scandal. The other high profile accused in the case, parliamentarian Kani Mori, was also acquitted. Both are politicians from the DMK party in the southern state of Tamil Nadu. Fifteen other people, including bureaucrats and businessmen, were also acquitted of charges. What really was the 2G scam? A term that's possibly the most recognizable one on Indian television in the last couple of decades. The scam was triggered when then Telecom Minister A. Raja opted for first come first served policy to distribute lucrative wireless telecom licenses. Raja is accused of having taken bribes to arbitrarily change the rules to benefit certain companies and individuals. He allegedly changed the cutoff date for the application of a license and sold the spectrum to a seven year old price at a seven year old price rate rather, which means that the prices of allocation of second generation spectrum licenses for mobile communications in India were grossly underestimated. The matter came to light when the Comptroller of Aud and Auditor General or CAG of India, then headed by a man called Vinod Rai, came out with a report that said that licenses awarded by the telecom department were given away at throwaway prices, resulting in a loss of 1 lakh, 1 lakh 77,000 crore rupees to the exchequer of the government. Roughly, that would be $40 billion. That is the kind of loss, notional loss, that the government is said to have suffered in the issuing of these licenses. What happened in court today then? The hearing in India's biggest corruption scam lasted six years. The Delhi court was jam-packed this morning. Judges took just a few moments to pronounce the verdict, reading out the operative part, which was one sentence. And I'm quoting here, I have no hesitation in holding that the prosecution has miserably failed to prove the charges and all the accused are acquitted of the charges. So essentially, no one's guilty. It's important to note what the judge said today. The CBI, India's premier investigative agency, could not prove that the accused had conspired to receive kickbacks from the sale of phone permits, causing a loss of $40 billion to the government. Essentially, the judgment says there was no evidence on the record produced before the court indicating any criminality in the acts allegedly committed by the accused. It's a hard-hitting comment from the judge. And I'm quoting again, I waited for someone with some legally admissible evidence in his possession, but all in vain. Not a single soul turned up. This indicates that everybody was going by public perception created by rumor, gossip and speculation. But public perception has no place in judicial proceedings. The essence of today's developments lies in the fact that the probe agency could not provide legally admissible evidence to support its case. Is it difficult to prove such a case? Why was there no admissible evidence when the entire country had heard of the loss and the alleged bribes? Why were 122 Spectrum licenses cancelled by the Supreme Court if there was no scam?
For the moment, we are turning, uh, turning to India's neighborhood, uh, Myanmar. The Rohingya crisis poses a massive security challenge, not just for the country where it happened, for neighboring Bangladesh in particular and South Asia in general. A minister from the Sheikh Hasina government in Dhaka has raised fresh concerns now. Obedul Qadir, who serves as the transport minister of Bangladesh, says there is new evidence to prove how Pakistan's ISI is trying to hatch a conspiracy to foment unrest using Rohingya terror groups. The influx of Rohingyas into Bangladesh has been one of the biggest humanitarian crises staring the global community. The mass exodus has posed a major challenge to the Bangladesh government. The refugees have added to the pressure on the limited resources of the country. But there is another threat that the refugees pose before the South Asian region. Obedul Qadar, the Bangladesh Transport Minister, has drawn the attention of the world yet again to the terror threat from Pakistan. Qadar has accused Islamabad of hatching a conspiracy with Rohingya terrorist groups. The Transport Minister, in a statement, blamed Pakistan's intelligence agency, the ISI, for hatching a conspiracy to spark unrest in Bangladesh. Qadar was talking about the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA, a group behind the terrorist attacks against police forces in Myanmar. The ARSA became a subject of global news coverage when they struck 30 police posts in Rakhine on August 25th this year. 12 people were killed in the attack. India and Bangladeshi intelligence agencies have uncovered links between ARSA and the ISI in the past. ARSA's leader, Hafiz Tohar, was allegedly trained in Pakistan by members of the Lashkar-e Taiba. The refugee crisis poses a massive security challenge for South Asia. It's a concern that the Indian government has also raised in Bangladesh. Now there are fears that the ISI may use the Rohingya crisis to foment trouble in the region. We report beyond. It is essentially a tale of two countries. On one hand, there's Pakistan, which despite warnings, continues to push its sinister plan to radicalize the Rohingya. On the other hand is India, which is now lending a helping hand to both Bangladesh and Myanmar to tackle the humanitarian crisis that has been unfolding for months now. Under Operation Insaniyat, the government of India sent 700 tons of relief material to Bangladesh for the Rohingya refugees. The relief material took care of 62,000 families. A week before this consignment, the Indian Air Force had delivered 53 tons of relief materials to Chittagong. India has now decided to spend $25 million in the next five years to develop the state of Rakhine, the state in Myanmar where the refugees came from. The foundation for the agreement was set during Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Myanmar in November this year. The Ministry of External Affairs has said that the agreement intends to help the government of Myanmar to achieve normalcy in Rakhine. Pakistan, meanwhile, is hatching a conspiracy with Rohingya terror groups. That is what the Minister of Transport of Bangladesh has claimed. Obedul Qadar made the statement in front of reporters during his visit to Kolkata. He said that the Bangladesh government has received reports on how the ISI is behind this plan. He could be hinting at the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, which has been linked to Pakistan-based terrorist groups. Earlier this year, remember, Indian and Bangladeshi intelligence agencies chanced upon fresh evidence that revealed the inner workings of this Salvation Army, the Rohingya Salvation Army, and its links with Pakistan's ISI. Intelligence officials intercepted three telephonic conversations between the 23rd and 24th of August. Raids and further investigation by Bangladeshi authorities have revealed the involvement of Brigadier Ashfaq and Major Salamat of the ISI, who were in touch with a man called Hafiz Tohar. He's a military wing chief of the ARSA. One such call was made on the 23rd of August, where Tohar received instructions to hit multiple targets within the next 48 hours. Listen into this. Attack right after the black man submits his report. Yes, sir, whatever you say. But it cannot happen before the night of 24th. The ISI officer wanted the attacks right after former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan submitted his report to the Rohingya, on the Rohingya crisis rather, in August. They spoke again the next day when Brigadier Ashfaq ordered Tohar to launch the attacks as soon as possible. Here's another trans excerpt. When is the black man making his report public? At 3 p.m. in a few minutes from now. Why are you taking so much time? It takes time to convey the message. 
No wonder then that the security, that security rather in, uh, in Rakhine is a major concern for the global community. Former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, who led this advisory commission on Rakhine, had issued a warning. In that report, he said that unrest could spiral out of control if the status quo continues. Violence, in fact, is not new to Rakhine. In recent years, and before this mass exodus that we've seen this year, there were sporadic spurts of violence. Myanmar's authorities have been criticized globally for failing to act swiftly. Did they do nothing at all? One cannot say that for sure. They tried nighttime curfews for one. They tried to impose a state of emergency for brief periods to bring the situation under control. But these measures failed to produce desired results. Human rights groups like the Human Rights Watch have accused Myanmar's government of complacency. The government, of course, denies these allegations. Some cases have been raised before the judiciary in that country after the violence in 2013, for example. At least 10 Muslims and 20 Buddhists were put in jail for life. But the Myanmar government is yet to come up with a long-term solution for this crisis. India's security agencies, meanwhile, have been, uh, have been asked to closely monitor the movement of Rohingyas. They've been asked to start an intelligence gathering process to identify and map entry points and travel routes used by Rohingyas. Look at this map on your screen. So far, West Bengal and Tripura have been identified as the most popular transit points. Two locations in particular, Hili and Haridaspur, are the most common entry routes for India. These two cities were in West Bengal. They're close to the city of Hara, from where uh, Rohingyas are known to travel to Delhi, Hyderabad and Jammu. These cities are known to have large populations of Rohingya Muslims. India's decision to extend assistance to Myanmar can also be seen as an attempt to counter China's checkbook diplomacy in the region. China has ambitious plans to expand its investment portfolio and wants to add Myanmar to its list. Chinese projects and investments are valued at more than $7 billion in that country alone. China has its eye on a deep sea project in Rakhine which can connect the violence at state to the Bay of Bengal. And this explains why China wants a stake in this project so desperately. The investment will advance its one belt, one road plans. Reports claim that China wants a majority stake in the project, which could be anywhere between 70 to 85 percent. While India has received criticism for its decision to crack down and deport Rohingyas, experts say the approach is pragmatic. This is how it works. After the world has made a noise and slammed the government in Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi and her administration will be the only ones left to clean up this mess. India has been at the receiving end of Western hypocrisy in the past and empathizes, some say, with its eastern neighbor. Working in conjunction with Myanmar also boosts Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Act East policy. To open doors to the East, India has several infrastructure projects lined up where it requires Myanmar to play ball. Some of these projects are the India-Myanmar-Thailand Trilateral Highway and the Kaladan Transit uh, Transport Project. These will connect India with Myanmar through sea and road. This also elevates India's profile within BIMSTEC. In recent times, many experts have called on the Indian government to abandon SARC in favor of BIMSTEC due to the stalling tactics, stonewalling tactics of Pakistan. So all of it adds up as far as India's foreign policy is concerned. India also continues in the meantime to be sensitive to the massive humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. Journalists from around the world have documented the plight of lakhs of Rohingyas. The United Nations wants access to Rakhine so that it can send its investigators. This year, Vion correspondents travelled both to Rakhine in Myanmar and to Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, the two cities which are at the heart of this crisis. These Rohingya refugees have left everything behind. <laughs> The violence in Rakhine has pushed more than 600,000 refugees into Bangladesh, but they still have nowhere to go. The Bangladesh government will not accept them. Myanmar has refused to recognize them. The mass exodus of Rohingyas has turned the coastal city of Cox Bazar into a massive relief camp. We on travel to Cox Bazar in September. At the Balukhali camp in Cox's Bazar, the hills have been filled up by Rohingya members with makeshift camps made of plastic sheets and thatched huts. 
Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has urged the international community to put pressure on the Myanmar authorities to take these people back as opposed to asking Bangladesh to open its borders, its own economic burdens. It wasn't just the Rohingya Muslims, the Hindu community also was attacked in Rakhine. Some of them managed to escape to Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, in the similar places across Okia and Cox's Bazaar. One of such persons is Chittaranjan Pal, who we're going to speak to. An insurgent group has waged a movement against the government in Myanmar. We moved to Bangladesh in the face of their atrocities. This group had confined us for eight days in our village and did not let us go outside for groceries or even to get water. After some days, we got to know that they had killed many Burmese Hindus in Fakira Bazaar, which is two kilometers away from our village. Back in Rakhine, authorities discovered mass graves as inconsolable family members watched in horror. Some members of the Hindu community managed to find shelter and relief camps set up by the Myanmar government. But when we on visited one of the camps, we found survivors living in dire conditions. One family narrated the horrific tale of their survival. While the global community is pointing fingers at Myanmar's military for the crisis, they continue to deny any wrongdoing. According to estimates from Doctors Without Borders, more than 6,000 Rohingyas have been killed during the violence in Myanmar. With Manish Shukla and Saad Hamadi, Bureau Report, Weon. Now, just two months after the secession bid failed, Catalonia is voting to elect a new regional government. Long queues could be seen at voting booths in Barcelona and elsewhere today as people lined up to cast their ballots. There are seven contenders in the selection. Of these, a total of three want to remain with Spain. Three want independence and one remains non-aligned. Opinion polls have predicted a neck-and-neck -neck race between the pro- and anti-independence camps. If the secessionists fail, if they fail to get absolute majority in today's vote, that would be a big blow to Depot's president, Carles Puigdemont, and would hobble his campaign for independence. On the other hand, a vote in favor of Puigdemont, uh, together for Catalonia party, the Catalan Republican left, or the popular unity candidacy, might revive the agitation for secession. It might lead to another showdown with Spain and possibly another ex extension of Spain's direct rule. There's also the possibility that none of the parties get near the majority mark, and there's a coalition. But given the differences, most experts believe this would be an arduous task. The opinion polls had kept the Catalan Republican left much ahead of Puigdemont's Together for Catalonia. The pro-Spain Citizens Party was projected to come second. And this suggests a majority either for independence parties or in favor of Spain is unlikely. In October this year, remember, separatists led by Carlos Puigdemont had declared independence from Spain following a controversial referendum. Spain refused to acknowledge the results and declared the referendum illegal. Spain's Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy sacked the Catalonian government, dissolved the regional parliament and called for fresh elections. Tens of thousands of pro-secession supporters as well as those standing for Spain's unity rallied in various cities. The secession bid was Spain's worst political crisis in decades. The turmoil hit the regional economy. Tourism suffered. Over the past few months, more than 3,000 companies shifted their headquarters from this region. Will today's vote lead to a solution or more turmoil? We'll have to wait for an answer to that, of course. For the moment, we can talk about where the Catalan leader, Carl Puigdemont, uh, is uh, and when this... Uh, when this drama is unfolding in Spain. The Catalan leader had fled Spain after, uh, after it slapped charges of sedition on him. He remains at an undisclosed location in Belgium, some 1,200 kilometers away from where the action is. He has been addressing supporters via video link, and his deputy, Oriol Junqueras, has been rallying supporters from jail. Puigdemont's location in Belgium is not known. He's believed to have lived in uh, Flanders, a region that is sympathetic to the Catalan separatist movement. Puigdemont had appeared at a Catalan separatist rally in Brussels earlier this month, but he has so far failed to find any support 
in the government in Brussels and stands isolated in the European Union. On Thursday, his wife voted in Girona while a Catalan teenager cast the proxy vote for Puigdemont. Now, US President Donald Trump is telling the world that the recent tax bill passed by the Senate is a Christmas gift for the middle and lower income households in America. But is it actually the US President and his family who are the biggest winners of the tax overhaul? Take a look. I'm doing the right thing and it's not good for me, believe me. For months, Donald Trump insisted that the tax bill passed by the Senate this week would protect low and middle income households and not the wealthy and well-connected. But the bill seems almost tailor-made to benefit the president and his inner circle. Here's how. The bill cuts the individual tax rate from 39.6% to 37%. The bill increases the exemption on estate tax, or the wealth of deceased persons before it is distributed to their heirs, from $11 million to $22 million for married couples. One major provision is a 20% tax deduction for owners of pass-through businesses, which don't pay corporate taxes, but pass through income to their owners' individual income taxes. Nearly all of the more than 500 private businesses Trump has claimed on his financial disclosure documents, including his umbrella company, the Trump Organization, are pass-throughs. So the bulk of his income will probably see an immediate tax break. The pass-through deductions are even for those who aren't paying wages or creating jobs. In other words, Wealthy real estate investors like Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, will benefit from the new law. Yeah, Tax experts say that real estate right. leasing and rental businesses will benefit more than any other industry. No. In 2005, Trump said he made $67 million from rental real estate alone. It's not just Trump who personally benefits. Sons Donald Jr. and Eric, who now manage the Trump Organization, also benefit. So does daughter Ivanka and her husband, Jared Kushner, who work in the White House but also have private ownership stakes in clothing and real estate companies. An analysis by Washington-based think tank, the Center for American Progress, finds that changes to business rules will save Trump roughly $11 million to $15 million a year, while the amendment to the estate tax would potentially save his heirs $4.5 million. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country and reform, but tax cut, really something special. There's a caveat. By not releasing his tax returns, Donald Trump has ensured it's impossible to know precisely how much he's gained. Your report, we on. Taxes India has long been regarded as a highly non-tax compliant state. For a country that is recorded to have 100 billionaires, the fourth highest in the world, it has just five people declaring taxable income above 100 crore rupees. In February this year, the finance minister addressed the issue of non-compliance in his budget speech. Now, 10 months down the line, a report from the income tax department reinforces Jaitley's claims. The report says that in a country with 1.2 billion people, just five people declared income of over 100 crore rupees in the financial year 2015-2016. There were as many as 55,331 individuals with income between 1 to 5 crore rupees, while those with income between 5 to 10 crore rupees was a little over 3,000. A total of 1,156 individuals were earning between 10 and 25 crore rupees. There's only one person though, only one, who's earning more than 500 crore rupees in India. While demonetization did bring in 9.1 million new taxpayers into the system, the compliance level is far from satisfactory. And that is how things stand. North Korea and South Korea are two radically different societies. One has been ruled by the same family for decades. The other has had a freewheeling democracy. But one thing that unites them is their love for fermented cabbage. Take a look. Kimchi, a staple diet in Korea, is a traditional dish made from salted and fermented veggies. However, it is a cultural component that divides Korean opinions. In the north, kimchi is often eaten with rice, also a staple. Whereas in the south, the dish goes with the American and Vietnamese cuisines. Our people eat kimchi every time they have a meal. For example, when they eat rice and meat soup, they eat kimchi. When they drink liquor or beer, they eat kimchi. Kimchi is an essential element of the dining table.
Kimchi is from both the North and the South, featured separately on UNESCO's list of the world's intangible cultural heritage, and tastes differently in both countries. Kimchi researchers say, in the South, the warmer climate makes cabbage harder to store, and therefore kimchi is saltier and stronger. Availability of specialized kimchi fridges in the South and access to spices make the North-South flavor gap more prominent. The kind of kimchi eaten in the North is similar to the kimchi eaten before modern era. Barring the taste, kimchi carries a sentimental element that binds all Koreans. Bureau Report, Pyon. On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas, leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.